Can you please get into the Order, please. We'll call the meeting. Public counts to order. Uh, for before we start, I'll remind those in attendance to place their phones on silent or vibrate. And I will ask the committee members to introduce themselves, starting with Ms. LeBlanc. Good morning, Susan LeBlanc, MLA for Dartmouth North. Good morning, Lisa Roberts, MLA for Halifax Needham. Good morning, Tim Hallman, MLA for Dartmouth East. Good morning, Rafa Di Costanzo, MLA for Clayton Park West. 
Good morning, Bill Horn, MLA for Waverly Fall River Beaver Bank. Ben Jessam, Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Good morning, Brendan McGuire, Halifax Atlantic. Hugh McKay, Chester St. Margaret's. Thank you very much. Uh, on today's agenda, we have officials from the Department of Transportation Infrastructure Renewal with us to discuss the selection and quality management of bridge projects in Central and Western Districts from the May 2019 report of the Auditor General. Uh, at this time, I'd ask the witness to introduce themselves, please. Beginning with Mr. Crocker. Mayet, sorry. Yeah. Don Mayet, um, Executive Director of Construction for TIR. Will Crocker, Bridge Maintenance Engineer, TIR. Uh, Peter Hackett, Chief Engineer, TIR. Deputy Minister, TIR. If you now would like to begin with your opening remarks, we'll start from there. Mr. LaFleche. Uh, good morning. I'm Paul LaFleche, the Deputy Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. With me today, I have the gentleman just introduced. Peter Hackett is TIR's Chief Engineer and oversees both the highway and public work side of the uh, department in that capacity. That is actually a, a, a legal position which uh, involves uh, sign off on engineering projects. Uh, Donald Mayette is the Executive Director of Highway Engineering Construction, uh, reporting to Peter Hackett, and uh, he would be in charge of uh, all of the uh, bridge and road designs uh, in Nova Scotia that are done under provincial jurisdiction. Will Crocker is our Senior Bridge Maintenance Engineer. He's the guy who calculates uh, what we need when we need it, determines what needs to be repaired, and uh, how long it might be good for. The safety of our roads and bridges is a priority to the department and to the government. Our inspection and maintenance activities are focused on ensuring that our 4,100 bridges and structures are safe for travel, our bridges receive regular inspections, and maintenance is necessary as required. We have 12 bridge engineers, 13 to 15 bridge inspectors, and dozens of additional regular and seasonal support staff whose job it is to ensure that our bridges are safe, maintained, and well-constructed. Like every Canadian province, we face the problem of aging infrastructure, changing needs, and funding challenges. Nova Scotia's climate is very hard on bridges given our heavy reliance on road salt and the many freeze-thaw cycles we experience east winter. To give an example, uh, it's an oversimplification, but somewhere around early November in Edmonton, it went below zero, and somewhere around early April in Edmonton, it came above zero. They had one freeze-thaw cycle. In that duration, we had 100 freeze-thaw cycles. So, even though they have colder temperatures, it goes down, it stays down. Ours go up and down, up and down, up and down, and that moves the structure. That moves the abutments the structure is connected to. It moves the roadway, the pavement. All of that is moving all the time. So Nova Scotia, because of its milder climate, is actually harder, and because that climate is near zero for much of the year, it's harder on our structures than in most provinces. The budgeted $45 million we have for uh, bridges ensures that priority bridge repairs, rehabilitation and replacement needs are being net met. The, the Department of Transportation Infrastructure Renewal accepts all recommendations made by the Auditor General recently about the management of bridge projects. The Department is committed to improving our bridge data information systems implementing consistent criteria for assessing bridges, tracking warranties better, reviewing our resource allocation, and implementing appropriate written policy around training of bridge inspectors. There is one statement, however, that the Auditor General made in releasing this report, which I would like to comment on. The Auditor General stated that the current rate of new bridge construction, it would take about 200 years to replace all provincially owned bridges. We would suggest that uh, while this statement is factually correct, there are many mitigating factors. For example, new bridges are currently constructed for an intended 75-year lifespan, and many of our older bridges have lasted much longer than that, 
uh, and much longer than their original design life. Uh, as a result of our regular maintenance program and upkeep, every year the department also undertakes work on hundreds of bridges to extend their service life. With that said, we would be happy to take any commit questions at this point by the committee. I will have a number of copies of uh, my statement available for the opposition the media shortly. I, oh, is this them? They've arrived? Okay. So uh, if someone who doesn't have a scooter wants to pick them up. Okay. There Thank you, Mr. Lefesh. We'll now open for the questions, beginning with the PC caucus and Mr. Hallman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for your ongoing work for the uh, people of uh, Nova Scotia. Before I uh, begin uh, my line of questioning, I do want to acknowledge uh, the great uh, work that the uh, staff of TIR do that I know MLAs across the province see them do that uh, each and every day. Um, to your point, Mr. LaFleche, I do also want to recognize that, um, you know, the obstacles and the challenges uh, certainly, I know in the two years that I've been an MLA, I certainly uh, have come to understand that as well, uh, specifically with relations to the, the freeze-thaw that we see in, this, in the, uh, the wintertime, uh, your, um, your mentioning of the milder climate, uh, and then of course, um, you know, the, seeing the bigger picture, the larger context in which our infrastructure exists in Nova Scotia. Uh, so certainly I want to acknowledge that um, I certainly understand that larger context. Uh, however, there are some key questions that I have for you today that I hope we can engage in a, in a meaningful conversation. Um, so we know from the report, the Auditor General's report, that the department is responsible for approximately 4,200 bridges, and with that, 45 million uh, is allocated to maintain, repair, and re replace these bridges uh, when required. So I'm curious, in the report, it outlined that there seemed to be um, gray areas as to which bridges the province was responsible for. In, in some cases, there was that gray area. Why doesn't the department know exactly how many bridges it is responsible for? Mr. LaFleche. Uh, let me start with a generalization, because uh, I was told the media wants some shocking statements from me. Um, so I'll generalize. Uh, and then uh, our, uh, maybe uh, one of our engineers here can can tell you, but in general, there are many things we don't know we're responsible for. And you know, when I first came to transportation, I was quite surprised at that. Um, for instance, uh, it's not only bridges; it's it, we're doing a, a, a major review of dams now in Nova Scotia, it, all sorts of water control structures. Uh, it's it's other things. It may be harbor bottoms. It may be roads. And every time I go out and, and visit rural Nova Scotia, which I was just uh, doing with uh, one of the MLAs uh, uh, on uh, Monday, uh, we have a debate on who owns that road anyway. And I think there were about three of them on Monday. We, we were trying to figure out who owns. And then we have to find out that, you know, it used to belong to the federal government and then it was transferred uh, somewhere else and we're not quite sure if the transfer was executed properly in the day and on and on and on. So it's not unique to bridges. Uh, generally, uh, uh, there are a lot of things in Nova Scotia, we're not quite sure if the province owns them or the federal government owns them. Now when I say a lot, that's a small percent because there are, are millions of assets in Nova Scotia. So we're talking a small percent of the total assets. It's nothing anybody should be worried about. And generally these situations arrive when we find out when something's broken. A few years ago, the Gabarus uh, breakwater was one case in point. Uh, another one, another case in point was the, uh, uh, the um, swing bridge at the, uh, the causeway uh, leading to Cape Breton. Uh, federal government said we owned it, we said they owned it. A lot of lawyers got in rooms for about six months and we extracted nine million bucks for them and now we own it. Um, this is the way things work. I, I know that everybody wants certainty in life, but sometimes some of these ancient arrangements pre-Confederation do not have certainty. Um, so uh, we, we have to deal with them as they come up and we do our best. We try and figure out on Monday, one of your colleagues, uh, uh, Mr. Rushton, uh, showed me a, a road that he would like to be fixed up. 
and we stood there and he didn't know and Peter didn't know and I didn't know and Don was there with me and Don didn't know and nobody knew uh, who exactly owned that road. So we will be finding out who owns the road and finding out who's supposed to fix it up. Sometimes when we find out who's supposed to fix it up, we find out they don't have any money to fix it up and it's a public issue that has to be cleaned up so it devolves to the province. Sometimes we can convince the federal government that they should cost shared with us and these things go on. They're very small percentage of cases but they do arise. So it's not surprising that we would have some bridges which are confusing because our 4200 that you quote, uh, in fact I said 41, Auditor General says 42, I could find someone else that says 43 because it's how you define them. Uh, some of them are long culverts, so they're called a structure or a bridge, and, you know, depending on how long they are. So we could debate the length of the culvert, depending on, you know, where the abutments are, and we get a different definition of whether that should be tossed into the 4,000-something or out of the 4,000-something and called a culvert. So there's all things like that. There's culverts on logging roads, et cetera, et cetera, which are called bridges, and they're on old logging roads that the Crown may have inherited when a particular company went bankrupt. And we're trying to figure out now, are those, uh, are those ours? Do they belong to a trails group? Et cetera, et cetera. So that's a, a, a long answer, and I hope that was uh, sufficiently uh, interesting for the media for today. With that, Peter, who do you want to send that question I can, to? I can do a bit of that. Okay. Mr. Hackett. <clears throat> So uh, just following up on the Deputy Minister's comments, um, it is true, a lot of infrastructure out there. Uh, for a good part of it, I'd say 99% of it, uh, we do have a fairly good idea of who's, who is an ownership. And then there's always those gray areas, who owns this structure, who owns this road, who owns this trail. And a lot of these things have happened over the years because of different agreements that have come up or different um, transfers, such as the Mesh Missile Exchange Agreement that happened between the province and municipalities. And things weren't really that clear at that time in 1996 about who owns this bridge or who owns this road. So it's something that we're actually working on now as a separate project to try to get those uh, things figured out. We, we work with UNSM and uh, Municipal Affairs to figure out who owns some of these this infrastructure, such as bridges, it's roads as well. And the other part of this is that uh, uh, there is some things with uh, natural resources. Uh, it's government, but is it is it transportations or is it DNRs or is it some other government agency? So those are another th things we come across uh, once in a while as well. Who owns this infrastructure now? For today, I guess the crux of today's discussion is the, um, uh, the Auditor General's report and as part of his report is about our uh, information system and how we input our data and what that data gives us. And that's sort of where we want to be going forward is to improve that, that system so it's updated and it, and it has all that information in there fairly clearly and that's where we like to go in the future uh, because you know, we all change, we're not going to be here forever and for the next people that come along we want to make it fairly clear of who owns what and who's responsible for what and that's what we're dealing with now because things happened in 1996 or before that and, and we weren't here. So we're trying to get those things cleared up. But it doesn't happen a lot um, but we do have some out there that, that we have some um, uh, grey on, on who owns what. Not on any major highways like 100 series, trunks, routes, and mostly locals, but you are going to find some on smaller locals and uh, you know smaller class roads and things like that that we would have some some uh, discussions about. We do have a couple of here in the city with HRM that we we debate about who owns the ownership uh, because of the municipal exchange agreement back in 1996. But we didn't let those go. We don't. We're not sitting in the middle of those and, and uh, saying they're yours or they're ours. We're actually we actually inspect those bridges regardless, uh, just because they need to be inspected as part of the inspection program. It doesn't matter who owns them because we have a responsibility of the public. Mr. Flesh. I would like to add on the question, the broader question of public assets, there is a light at the end of a tunnel. Um, there, uh, we have a group put together led by transportation and infrastructure renewal, working with all government departments and crown agencies uh, to put together a GIS database and we're slowly working away at figuring out who owns all these structures. Uh, control structures, assets, dams, breakwaters, uh, roads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So one day, uh, probably not fast enough for those who like a lot of detail quickly, but one day, as resources allow, we will have a GIS system capable of zooming in on anything in Nova Scotia and figuring out who owns who owns that, or uh, sometimes it's 
who's responsible for it, which is different than who owns it. Thank you. Mr. Hallman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, certainly, you know, the notion that this is the way things work, I'm sure, gentlemen, you're aware that, um, you know, that confusion over to who's responsible for what is a source of great frustration for Nova Scotians, and certainly MLAs hear that time and time again. Uh, it is good to hear that there are there is ongoing work to try to determine who's responsible uh, for what bridges or what lakes. I know in Dartmouth, oftentimes, that's a, often a, a point of uh, contention as to who's responsible for what. And this, I think this needs to be clarified. It certainly has to be clarified in the name of, uh, of certainly public safety. Okay, so historically, I'm curious, what was the total number of bridges approximately 10 years ago in our province? Mr. Crocker. The overall, the overall number of bridges really hasn't changed significantly. We've added some with highway twinning, um, on occasion, there's been some removed from service, if typically on a, a backwoods K-class road. Uh, the overall number that we've always been quoting in terms of number of bridges has been 4,100 to 4,200 in my time with the department. Mr. Holland. Do you think we should be able to quote an accurate number as to the amount of bridges we have in Nova Scotia? Is that is that a realistic expectation? Mr. Crocker. Part of that goes back to uh, having the information system like uh, was already mentioned, as well as what truly defines a bridge. Previously, uh, structures have been assigned what's called a structure ID and classified as a bridge, um, whereas now we define a bridge as a structure with a span three meters and greater. Uh, and in cer certain cases, some of those structures have been uh, assigned a bridge ID, but they're really not a bridge, they're a culvert. So that's why some of those numbers have been fluctuating over time. And as mentioned previously, we're slowly working towards uh, clarifying not only what structures are truly a bridge, but also the responsibilities. Mr. Holman. Okay, um, let's, let's go back 10, 20 years within the, the department. I'm curious what reforms have been done over the years uh, within the department to improve efficiency, to cut down on time uh, for project completion schedules, spending less on goods and materials, improving worker efficiency and record, and, and to record uh, data collection. Can you outline what changes have happened over a 10 or 20 year period of time within the department? Mr. LaFleche. I, I've only been uh, seven years now in the department, a little over seven <laughs> years, so uh, I'll go back at least during my time. And uh, one of the things we're, we're very proud about is our innovation capacity as a department. We're always trying to innovate, and we uh, encourage all of our staff uh, throughout the province to look at all sorts of innovations that would achieve uh, better results with less dollars. Because we're always being uh, challenged by dollars and the public has high expectations. So many efficiencies or changes have been brought forward over the years. I'll just mention one and I'll let Lee Peter go into some others. But one of them would be the brining program the pre-brining program. That was an innovation that was brought in uh, due to uh, a particular uh, engineer that we had uh, who had seen it work elsewhere and uh, thought that this may work given our climatic conditions. It wouldn't work everywhere. It doesn't work everywhere in the province because we have a province where the climate does vary considerably from southwest Nova to the Cape Breton Highlands. Uh, but it has been a real boon, and you've seen HRM take it up. Um, so those type of innovations, I just mentioned that one in particular, are the types of things we're always bringing in, uh, and uh, the type of equipment we use, we innovate on that. Again, our equipment is different than diff in different areas of the province, and different than equipment in New Brunswick. Uh, when we get hit with a big storm like we did, I believe it was in 15, we, and which is a very rare storm, a hundred year type winter, every Wednesday we seem to have a big storm. Uh, we didn't have probably the equipment we need to do it. But on the other hand, we wouldn't want to have that equipment sitting around 
paid for depreciating for 99 years. We brought in some equipment from other places. So I'm talking about some of the big machinery you'd see in northern Quebec and northern New Brunswick in Labrador. Um, so we do the best we can. Uh, our equipment needs are very different. And in fact, uh, our equipment in many areas has to serve subdivisions as well as twinned highways. So we have to have equipment which is very flexible and can go between the two. So we're always innovating on the equipment side, looking at what we can do. As some of you know, some of you have toured our shop at Miller Lake. We have a very large shop where we take in basic chassis and we build them to specs and needs. This last year we acquired a very large plow, which we're using on the, the Cobequid. Uh, it's, a, it's a sort of a one of, and uh, it's in your area, Mr. Rushton. You've probably seen it. Mr. Hallman. Sorry, I, I must apologize. I've twice called you Mr. Rushton. Um, it's because I saw you once in the dark with Mr. Rushton, and I think I called you the twin brothers. Um, but uh, that's good. Um, <laughs> when you get old and you've had cataract surgery twice, you know. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Hallman, uh, sorry, it's in Mr. Rushton's area. Um, so we have things like that. Peter, do you have uh, examples you'd like to talk about? Mr. Hackett. Um, yeah, so it, it, there's always changes going on technology, both uh, in our department, right across the country. We follow a lot of um, things that are happening in, in other provinces. We work together with other provinces across the country um, to determine what they're doing to make more efficiencies and, and to make things better in the transportation system. Um, you know, one of the things we do have, we do have a challenge, obviously, with budgets. We're, we're a department that's always struggling with uh, trying to keep our budgets balanced, and uh, we always have a lot of work. We have, as uh, Minister Lefle or Deputy Minister LaFleche mentioned, that we have uh, winters that are sometimes unpredictable, but we still have to make sure the level of service is done. So uh, we, we, do the, we do the work that we have to keep the roads cleared. Uh, but then we try to do some innovative things, like he mentioned uh, pre-wetting and, and going out and doing that before uh, uh, snowstorms, so that prevents le that's the less salt you have to use if you do that. And uh, some of the trucks that we've changed around to have a more consistent fleet, so that's cheaper to do that with uh, mechanical uh, components that are that are the same. So that's certainly a, a, a way to try to keep our, our winter budgets down. Um, on the construction side, uh, things like on just speaking of the bridges, we try to make our bridges a, we go to tender a lot more consistent, so we get. Rid to things like bridge joints that cause a lot of money. We go to things like what they call integral and semi-integral abutments that would take uh, allow for the bridges to move sort of uh, fully as opposed to the joint system having to move. And if you don't have any joints, you have no leakage, so you don't have to replace those, and which cause other parts of the components of the bridge to, to uh, deteriorate. So we've done that over the last number of years. That's uh, been helpful to keep the longevity of the bridges. Um, in our paving program, probably about 15 years ago, we, we were very random about uh, what we, not so much what we s selected, uh, somewhat, uh, but we also um uh, went to a, what they call a peer review program. So we have on all of our roads, we collect data uh, every year on our major highways and then what highways we look at being uh, as part of our five-year plan, we go out and collect the data for that. Uh, then we sit around as a group and we determine what's the most efficient and effective way to pave those roads with the most economical way for the mo most longevity and based on traffic and condition and that sort of thing. So that's technology that's come across in the last probably 10 to 15 years, which is a way to do work uh, that you're not always going to get the Cadillac, but you're going to get something that lasts for a long period of time for the for the best value. Because, like I said, we do struggle with our with our budgets. So we've got to make sure we uh, we do the best that we can for the uh, for the public. Mr. Holm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, you've clearly outlined the innovation that's been happening on the equipment side. Could you now clearly outline the inno past attempts to innovate, um, creating a, a standard set of criteria? to rank bridges and determine the priority of uh, repairing those bridges. What have the previous attempts been at, uh, at trying to innovate in that area? Mr. Crocker. So uh, in the past, typical bridge replacements are, we have our bridge inspection program, which identifies uh, conditions of bridges and the district bridge engineers would use their engineering judgment to determine priorities um, based upon what they feel is, is the priority for their particular, particular district. Uh, those 
priorities are then provided to the head office and uh, prioritized on a, a provincial basis. Uh, in terms of uh, innovations and stuff, uh, as Peter mentioned, we do uh, we, we try to make rehabilitation as well as new bridge designs uh, more longer lasting and make them last for rather than a shorter period of time, a longer period of time to allow them to uh, make it longer before we're back in there and to try to coordinate those replacements and or uh, rehabilitations with our paving program. So for example, it makes sense to uh, replace the bridge joints before you come through with the paving project or fix holes or problems with the deck of the bridge before you come through with the paving project because then you're not digging it up a freshly paved road. Um, I don't know if do you have Thank anything. Thank you, Mr. Crocker. Uh, we'll now move on to the NDP caucus and Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. The Auditor General noted in uh, <coughs> Section 2.5 of the report that staff in the districts are saving information about bridge maintenance in a variety of different systems, such as spreadsheets, paper format, and in the information system, which I assume is in an internal government information management system. The Auditor General also noted that the records uh, that, that the records do not uh, exist, or, sorry, the records that do exist are not always clear or consistent. So my first question is, does the department have any existing policy on how records are to be taken and where they're to be stored, et cetera? Specific Mr. to TIR. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll let you, Peter, handle Mr. Hackett. So specifically to bridges, um, yes, our um, SIS system is really where we keep all of our information on, the, on our bridges across the province, and that's what's re referred to in this report. Um, it's, uh, it's basically not a system that, that gives you um, pumped out information. It's information that you put in, and then basically from there, it's the engineering division, the structural division, the engineering staff in the field that determine what's the next step with that bridge. So you do your inspection, you put the information in, uh, you, the information would be about what rating it would have, what condition it's in, um, you know, where it's located, that sort of thing. And then from there, the staff would determine what the next step is for that bridge, whether it has to be re rehabilitated or whether it's fine or whether that has to go onto a program eventually to be replaced. So that's kind of what the system is today. Um, so that information is, the, and the information is pretty much up to date. There are some issues, what you're talking about, with regard to spreadsheets and, and notes and that sort of thing. And I guess that's one of the things we want to kind of clarify with the public, that the inspections on all the bridges are, are being done. The issue here is that, is the information being in the system, and is it clear in the system, and is there enough information in the system to, to make good decisions? So. So the inspections on the bridges are being done annually, but sometimes it doesn't appear to be you know, recorded or it's not updated. And that's what we're trying to determine now to go forward, what's a better system to get into. Across the, pro across the country, there are systems out there, what they call basically bridge ma management systems, that when you put all the information in for that structure, it gives you um, uh, basically criteria that you should be looking at year after year on that specific bridge. So you, you, it creates a, a number of decision trees in that, that program, and from there, it tells you what your next step should be. Right now, we don't really have that because basically it's, it's the engineering staff that determines what's next. And, um, and that's sort of what I think is, is a bit of what's in the Auditor General's report. Um, and other provinces do have those systems and we are currently looking at, at going in that direction as well because uh, we see that's the way to go forward. Um, just going back to the previous question and, and uh, just on the technology part, um, that is if we can, uh, when, when I came here uh, 20 some years ago, we did not have any of these systems. It was strictly uh, just the engineers in the field and we didn't have any bridge engineers either. So we went from nothing to bridge engineers, to bridge teams, to bridge staff that look after this, to an SIS system. So we're progressing in that direction, but we need to get into the next direction of, of more technology. Ms. Lomelon. Well, thanks for that. Um, and you mentioned staffing and, and you know, people getting up to date with new systems and, and bringing in a newer system. Um, the Auditor General also found that there were inconsistencies in how things were recorded and that, and that not everyone understood how to use the systems. So I'm wondering if the department has any policies around training on how to complete and record the results of the inspections. Mr. Crocker. 
So level two inspections are completed by trained inspectors who have taken uh, a two week uh, intensive safety inspection for bridge, highway bridges course. Uh, it's put on by the Federal Highway Administration in the United States. Uh, all of our inspectors have received that two week training as part of their when onboarding when they first uh, become employees. There's also a refresher training for that uh, uh, course, sorry, which is done on a periodic basis. The level one inspections are done by operations staff and before they're allowed to complete the level one inspection, uh, they receive a, a level one training course from our district staff, either from a level to inspector or from the district bridge engineer. And there's an internal uh, course provided for that. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you. Uh, there were three bridges that the Auditor General identified that were both rated very poorly in terms of their condition and that the department could not provide further information to show that there had been, in the Auditor General's words, a conscious decision to leave these bridges off the five-year capital plan. Can you identify what those three bridges are and can you explain why they, uh, these bridges in serious need of repair or replacement were not included in the five-year plan? Mr. Hackett. Uh, sorry, I don't know the names of the bridges offhand. I know I have them and we can, we can provide them to you. Sure. I do know that those, I, think, I believe all three of those bridges were identified to either be, some are, and, and, and as Deputy uh, LaFleche mentioned was, uh, some of those bridges are small, they're like a culvert type bridge, but it's long enough to be a bridge. So I think they're sort of on the bridge program, but they're sort of on a different uh, budget to be replaced by, maybe like internal uh, or by the field. So, um, my understanding is that all three of those bridges are to be replaced, but not necessarily on the public plan because the five-year public plan only goes out, it's, it's only full for one year. And then after that, it goes 100% for next year. For instance, when we put it together this year, 70% for the year after, um, I think it's down to 40, 20, 10. So if it's four years out, you may not actually see it on that plan, but you might see it on like an internal document somewhere. So I think that's my understanding is there was work being done, but it's not published. I guess that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Mr. Flesh. Just in terms of safety, uh, maybe uh, we could comment on uh, if there, there is a, a bridge that uh, has a safety problem, what do we do, Peter? Mr. Yeah. Hackett. So on the, on the safety of structures, and I, and I guess that's sort of the, the most important part of this the whole discussion, um, is we aren't, you know, we're not in a situation with our bridges, even though we have a number, that, that, uh, a number of them that fall into the uh, fair to poor category. Um, the safety of the bridges is, is sort of the key part of our department and the safety and, and uh, of the highways. So those bridges are inspected, like I said, every year. And if the bridges are to the point that um, we see deterioration and we, we can only repair so much of it, we've got to keep it in service, then what we'd end up doing is changing the load on the bridge so you'd let less lighter traffic, let lighter traffic go across it. And then eventually if, if something happens, we can't fix it or it doesn't get into the system or something, um, you know, something fails on it, um, then we would close the bridge. So it's, so it, the, the whole, um, so the way we have our inspection program and the way we have our uh, structural engineers doesn't really allow for, uh, we would expect some sort of failure, like major failure. It's more of a gradual approach. And so the issue is on a lot of these things with, um, poor and fair and, and, and those ratings is that it's not the bridge really uh, having some type of big failure, it's more in the fact that the bridge would have to come out of service. And that's sort of where, that, and, that, and that's why this, the program we have works very well. It's the, it's the uh, system, the, the uh, software system that needs to be upgraded. But the internal program that we have, we ensure that, those, that the bridges are safe. And if they're not safe, then we would take it out of service or reduce the load. Mr. LaFletch. Yeah, just on the point of safety too, uh, we're here talking about the normal deterioration of a bridge over time, but there are specific events which occur from time to time which result in bridge inspections. Um, and I'm thinking of, uh, say, a, a, a vessel hits a bridge, a transport uh, truck uh, accidentally uh, without the clearance goes over and hits part of the bridge structure, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's a, some sort of a freak storm event uh, that affects the abutments. These are one of events, they're not, and we have to take care of those on an emergency basis, Peter. Ms. LeBlanc. 
Great, thank you. In your response to recommendation 2.2 of the report, the department said that you will ensure the process currently in place for decisions around bridge repairs and replacement is formalized. Could you provide more detail on how exactly those decisions are being made right now and by whom? You've talked a little bit about that already, but um, if there's anything more to add, and if there are uh, no documented criteria to rank them. So um, right now, the Auditor General is suggesting that you formalize the process. Um, what, what is in place now? What are you doing to formalize? Mr. Crocker. So currently, uh, bridges are inspected. They receive a rating. If there's a concern of identified by the inspector in terms of an immediate concern, that gets identified to the bridge engineer. Uh, otherwise, the, all, the ins, all the bridges that are inspected, they have their ratings. The district bridge engineer has their priority list, and that's some of the external spreadsheets that were referenced in the in the report. So they have their own prioritization sheet and they know the bridges in their district, they know uh, the condition of them, they know the rate ratings. So they will identify the prioritization uh, based partially on condition, uh, location, traffic volumes, all those sorts of decisions come into play as to where the dollar the dollars for either replacement or rehabilitation are spent. Uh, the process being they would identify from their district priority uh, program or spreadsheet, discuss with uh, the district director. They then provide their district priorities to head office and that would be uh, then for consideration for a provincial uh, priority list which then gets developed into the five-year plan, as Peter mentioned. Ms. LeBlanc. Okay, and is that consistent across the province and across all the different sort of tiers of, or levels of, of bridges? Like, is that the same cr criteria, is the same criteria used to assess all types of bridges all across the province? Mr. Crocker. So each, each district has their own spreadsheet. The, the layout, the format, the information in it probably varies. The same engineering judgment goes into it. So uh, obviously public safety, number one, regardless. Uh, and then beyond that, it's to try to keep the good bridges good and from deteriorating further and to uh, reduce the number of bridges that are rated in a poor condition. Mr. LeBlanc. Okay. Um Inspectors did not complete all regular inspections, we learned from the report. Last fiscal year, so 2018-19, 23% of bridges in the Auditor General sample requiring a level one inspection did not receive one. The rate of non-completion in the same sample was 21% in 2016-17 and 0% in 2017-18. So I'm wondering if you can provide an explanation for this fluctuation. Mr. Crocker. So that is just a snapshot, and it might be just luck that those are the numbers that came, came out. Uh, part of it stems back to the uh, software system being able to provide accurate data of what has and hasn't been done. So again, the inspectors have their own tracking spreadsheets of to what has and hasn't been done. Um, and the, the main key to keep in mind is that regardless, we have the level two inspections which are done on a four to five year basis and the level ones are done on an annual basis. Uh, to, and the level ones are more so geared towards maintenance issues or identifying smaller components or issues with the bridge. So the the, the fact that there's 20% or, or the 23% of the bridges might not have received an inspection, uh, we're confident that those were in fact done. It's just, it might not have been tracked or recorded properly. Mr. LeBlanc. 
I get what you're saying, but it still doesn't give comfort. I mean, we don't really know. I mean, they might have been done, and they might not, they, or they and they might not have been done, and they're not like the, there's no report or you know tracking of that. So I think uh, Nova Scotians would feel better about their the safety of their bridges if we just knew what was done, what wasn't done, uh, and it was consistent. Um, I'm going to move on to climate change mitigation for a second. So last week, July 4th, an expert panel convened by the Canadian Council of Academies released a report identifying the top impacts that Canada can expect from the climate crisis. As it happens, the cover of the report uh, on, this, uh, on these risks uh, was a picture of a flooded bridge. The report charted the key areas that are vulnerable to the cr climate crisis, and the two that were uh, by far the most likely that had the most catastrophic impacts, and this is the language that the report uses, catastrophic impacts, the most likely and most catastro catastrophic impacts will be on coastal communities like Nova Scotia and on physical infrastructure, including bridges. So we know that your department has estimated it needs 2.1 billion over the next 10 years to get on top of bridge repairs, but I'm wondering, when you, fact, when you figured out that number, have you taken into consideration the impacts of the climate crisis? Mr. Hackett. So in, um, so in, a, in, a, in their, uh, the bridges that are currently in place or in service today, um, you know, they would have been designed based on previous climate situations, I guess, from previous years. And, and as Dr. LaFleche mentioned, that, um, that we go back, some bridges are in there for 100 years or more. Some of our old truss bridges are there for a long time. And we have, um, you know, bridges that are, that are 80 years old and 70 years old. So those bridges are there. We haven't done a lot to them with regard to any kind of update for climate change unless there was something needed. If there was repair to be required, like, for instance, if the uh, Botmans had issues with them, we might put extra armor rock in them or put sort of some type of ice protection in, that sort of thing for the existing bridges, but only if something was required. On new bridges, on new construction, they are, um, we've gone to, um, I think we've gone to a larger um, size bridge over water uh, to make the opening larger. We've lifted the bridges higher for, we, we, I think we're up to 200 year storm. Are we doing the design for 200 year, still 100 year? One, one, year. one to 100 year storm. Plus climate change. It, right, and there's a climate change coefficient there as well. So the bridges are, are built with climate change in mind. Our culverts we put in now, our newer ones, are, are upgraded with climate change in mind. Um, and, uh, and so we, we try to build those in uh, as, as best we can. One of the things that's happened, as you mentioned, climate change. Um, so so we're, and, and that's, and, and what we're doing is not different than any other province, I guess. We're sort of staying consistent with other provinces and our structures and, and putting what they know, what other provinces know about climate change, we try to work together on that. The other thing is that we, um, we also uh, look at, um, you know, uh, around the structure itself, like the road. Because if you looked at the situation that happened in High River, Alberta, a number of years ago with the flooding out there, actually the bridges stayed in place and the roads disappeared. So we've got to look at not just right at the river, but around the entire river to, uh, into, the, into the bridge to make sure we have enough uh, scouring protection for that as well. So those things are taken into consideration now as we go forward. On our existing structures, it's kind of as, a, as they come along, I guess I would say. Ms. Laval. Thanks, and with the remaining time I have left, um, I just want to ask a quick question about the ferry. I am the TIR critic for the NDP, so I uh, want to know um, from, I guess, Dr. Lafeche, uh, what are the penalties for the delay in the service if we continue to have delay in service on the ferry, the Yarmouth ferry? Mr. Lafeche. Well, we, we didn't bring the staff here that uh, have uh, the ability to answer the exact question. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by penalties. Could you, could you talk about that? Ms. LeBlanc. So uh, in, the, um, in the agreement with Bay Ferries that we don't, that the public really doesn't have any access to, uh, I, want, I want to know if there are uh, penalties in place if the ferry service is delayed. So um, there's a contract in place. The people of Yarmouth are expecting the ferry to be running this, this summer for good reason, because we know that it benefits Yarmouth, it benefits the whole province. What is the province doing to make sure that those uh, people are not going to suffer financially uh, if the ferry continues to be delayed? Mr. LaFleche. Questions there. First thing, uh, the, the only thing that I know of that uh, is not available to the public is the management fee number. That's one number in the contract. I believe we have re re released the contract and uh, we can get you copies of that so you can actually have your own staff go through it and examine what you need to know there. Uh, the only thing you won't find out is what is the, what is the management fee. That's one number that's blanked 
in the whole contract, but all the other clauses with all the other numbers are in the contract. Uh, as for uh, mitigation, I think you were referring to mitigation for uh, uh, for uh, businesses or parties that may be affected. Is that what you were talking about? I'm just not. Are you talking about people who might be affected because the ferry is not sailing? Ms. Leblanc. Yes, I'm wondering if there are penalties in place that, that the province will leverage against or uh, level against bay ferries if the, can, if the ferry service continues to be delayed and if those penalties are being collected, how might they be used to benefit the people who are currently uh, suffering from the lack of the ferry service? Mr. It's a clear question, I think. Okay, I, uh, well, bay, bay ferries will only get the um, money that it actually expenses under the contract. So probably best for you to read the contract, we'll get you a copy of it. In other words, we're not paying them anything unless they have expenses. And whatever expenses they have, they have to document. Um, as for uh, anybody who suffers because there is a lack of a ferry, at this point uh, I am hopeful that there will be a ferry, so the suffering would be temporal in nature. And uh, as the Premier has said, uh, I think last week, we will, uh, we will uh, be tasked to look into that at some point. But we're not there yet. We haven't given up uh, on uh, having a season, and I understand that uh, um, uh, there's a lot of uh, mystery whirling around. But if you actually read the contract and uh, you uh, um, actually look at what the Premier has said, I think that will clear up uh, any misconceptions there. Thank you. That ends the NDP caucus time. I'll now turn over to Liberal Cox and Mr. McKay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, a lot of the questions and discussions seems to be about information, about data. And uh, as we discussed yesterday at the Health Committee meeting, we're in the data revolution following the technology revolution. And um, data is so important, uh, but only as good as the management system that's available for it. Um, and Deputy, you mentioned uh, that there's some initial work on uh, looking at GIS. Uh, for those maybe not familiar with that term, that stands for Geographic Information System. And um, what that does is relates things in a, a spatial context and then you attach additional information uh, to that regarding uh, the, uh, regarding the asset. Uh, now, in this case, I guess we'd be discussing tangible assets uh, such as bridges, roads, culverts, and so forth that TIR has. Um, and the idea of a GIS uh, is certainly, I think, advanced. Uh, that's a, a good approach. Uh, I'm wondering if you were undertaking this, are you doing it in collaboration with other departments such as internal services or, or others uh, so that we have a, an enterprise-wide uh, asset management system or is this something TIR would be doing on their own uh, and if so, would you be using provincial resources such as the community college system and so forth? Mr. LaFlesh. Okay, so at this point, uh, Mr. McK M MLA McKay, uh, we are, uh, we're at the front end of this. Uh, we're, we've picked a couple of pilot areas uh, where we're working with, we are working with other departments and agencies on this. Um, a, uh, the new Department of Service Nova Scotia Internal Services is the lead in geographic information systems. We are the lead in owning assets, if you will. And uh, so we're trying to put those two responsibilities together to develop a system which will not only track bridges and roads, but will attract buildings and major assets in those buildings, uh, track properties. There is already a property online system, uh, but it, it, it doesn't specifically address what we want to know. Uh, so our goal at the front end is to show uh, the people of Nova Scotia through our our political um, elected representatives uh, that such a system would be useful and uh, uh, can, uh, can be done on a cost-effective basis. Uh, so we're piloting a few different areas, if you will, where you can zoom in on any particular block, say in downtown Halifax, they'll just pick that out of the air, and then find out what are the provincial properties? What are those properties used for? 
what's in the property, what is the land owned around the property, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you had a dream of you and me, and of course we're from this business, so we like to dream, this is far beyond anything, we could find a TIR, uh, here's, this has got a number on it, right? We could find this on the property, uh, but that's a long way down where we are. We're trying to, to get to the, the uh, sort of the, the quick and dirty uh, big questions. Who owns the property? What's on the property? What's the value of it? What is it used for? And some of this is to determine if there are properties or assets of government which could be better utilized by someone else. Could be municipality, could be private sector, could be federal government, could be nonprofit groups, uh, because we have a lot of assets just sitting around. And any given week, we'll get uh, requests that come in and say, do you have X? Or I've seen that property out by the intersection of Y and Z. Can I, uh, is that available? And you know, sometimes we look into it and we find out, gee, yeah, that's available, uh, or X is available, and uh, maybe we're not really using it and we can, uh, uh, transfer it to a, a suitable nonprofit group or a municipality who would better utilize it and create value and jobs for Nova Scotians. But right now that's done on an ad hoc basis. It's done by someone driving around or identifying something or some, some group, a rotary group saying, gee, we need a tractor or we need a pickup truck. You know, we'd like to get to a more systemized thing where we would be able to list the surplus assets that we have. That's a dream that you and I can share. We'll be long gone before we get to it, but we can probably get to a, a higher level of that dream in the near future. Mr. McKay. Thank you very much for that uh, very fulsome response. Uh, I'm going to pass over to Mr. Jessam now, my colleague from... Uh... Mr. Jessam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to our guests and I, I'm at risk perhaps of getting into the weeds a little bit, but uh, in, in the interest of adding some context and confidence to uh, the work that's undertaken to assess our infrastructure bridges specifically in this case, uh, would our guests be able to offer I guess a, a more finite uh, synopsis of what goes into um, the process to uh, assess our bridges and decide where they fit in in terms of what needs to be fixed immediately later in the distant future, et cetera. Mr. Hackett. So, um, yeah, so into, into the finite, I'm, I'm not sure if I can get to how finite I can get into this, but I kind of I can explain this, some of it anyway. So, um, so as uh, Will mentioned, we do have a, uh, we have our bridge inspection and our bridge engineers in each district, and they, they inspect the bridges and they rate the bridges uh, every year. So that's from a rating of one to nine. And then in that rating system, you'll get down into the ratings between one and four, uh, which will get you into a, basically a fair to poor area. Now that doesn't mean that the bridges are uh, at the end uh, by any means. It might mean that uh, it's got a rating of a one because there's a piece missing off it, like a rail, or it could be a, a hole in the deck, not gonna be a failure, but has to be replaced, but it's a, it's a, it's a large issue that you should get to re repair. And then from there, um, you know, if it can be repaired, then the, then the district bridge engineers will basically um, repair it or put it as part of the rehab program. If they, if it gets to the point in those bridges that they're into that one to four rating and they start to continue or stay where they are and, they, and you can't get ahead of it, so then they get on the system to say that they've got to be replaced and they're sent in that, that the information for that structure is sent into head office, uh, into our office, and then we start to prioritize them based on our five-year plan. And then you're going to look at things like, um, you know, when can it get designed, and what's the we get the geotechnical work done for it, and then we get the engineering work done for it, and then we put it as part of the plan. The 
the uh, the difficult thing is some of these uh, is that some of these bridges are are large and some of them are very expensive. So you've got to make sure you budget for those, and that's where they'll show up in the plan. To you know, is it going to be in three years, four years, five years, two years, whatever you have for basically um, for your uh, your costs. And if you see something in there that's, uh, you know, we'll take, take an example, we'll use the Sheet Harbor Bridge, for instance, what was replaced a few years ago. That bridge is, was, a, was an old style design. We don't have many of those left in the province and it's good, we're getting rid of those because uh, they're complicated to inspect, they're complicated to uh, basically keep in service, but it was an old truss bridge. Um, it was uh, identified as being to the point that it had to be replaced. Now, the staff in the field kept repairing it and repairing it and repairing it to keep it in service, but the repairs started costing a lot of money to do that. So then you put it on the program, but it's gotta be, like I mentioned, all the design work, the geotechnical work has to be done. So we're looking at you know four or five years down the road. So you do as much as you possibly can, but the, but the rehab costs are still going up and up. And that's sort of where you balance between how much money you're putting into rehab and how much money is it gonna to take to replace it. So that bridge was about $16 million to replace, and it finally got itself pulled onto the program to get replaced. Sydney River Bridge was the exact same bridge that was done a, a year or two before that. So what I'm basically saying is that when it gets into that one to four range, our staff looks at those bridges and looks at the rehab that has to be done first. And if the rehab is fairly straightforward and fairly cheap, then they can do that in the field and you can basically maybe get that bridge from a rating of a two back up to a five. And that's, and that's pretty good. Or you try to keep it at that three or where that level is by keeping rehabbing it. But if you keep doing it and doing it, eventually it's gotta be replaced. And that's sort of where, so um, to the former members comment about the rating, that's where we're basically at right now. A lot of it is based on uh, our engineering staff and myself and, and our head office staff trying to prioritize these of when they should go into, into the system. We don't have, well we do have our own internal system that we use, but it's not uh, a published system on, a, on a, the actual um, uh, a bridge management system. So we'll look at where the bridge is located, we'll look at what the impact is to a community, we'll look at what the, uh, if there's a detour that we can use, so if we had to close the bridge, we look at what the services to the, to the economy of the province, so if you're looking at something on Highway 102 and you look at it as being uh, an issue, we, we just found an issue with one of our bridges out there just recently, that we're going to have to basically take out of service at some time soon, but we'll put a temporary bridge in to, re to do that. It was sort of, um, you know, we'll put a temporary bridge in because we know that's a link to the province. We can't detour people out there. So these, these decisions are all made from ourselves. They're engineering decisions internally. But what the Auditor General would like us to see is more of a, uh, I guess, uh, more um, caveats in there to say that based on these caveats, you should be replacing or rehabbing a bridge. So things like traffic volume, type of highway, um, you know, condition of structure, uh, climate change could be something. There's a, so they want us to have more of a, a decision-making process. But in some cases, that's really good because it could basically funnel into what bridges you want done, but you can't take away the human element of it as, as well. Because I could say to somebody, well, this bridge on Trunk 7, for instance, is in worse shape than this bridge on the 102. However, I can find a detour for the 107 bridge, but I have to repair the 102, or vice versa. So you have to have some human element involved with this. You're not gonna get every caveat in place to, make, to, to let the computer system make every decision for you, because it just can't. But it's in its current form, we have a pretty good system for replacing these things, and we also have a very good system with our staff that we look at a bridge and we say, should we push this bridge out and move this bridge in? And if the staff comes back and says, this bridge needs to be replaced, then we'll go and replace it. And, and so we have a lot of discussion over structures uh, prior to basically going into uh, putting them on replacement in the replacement program. So it is, it's a, it's, you know, if we had a, if we had a different type of management system, maybe it would be less taxing on, on us, but, you know, there is some human element that you're going to have to keep anyway, and we certainly have that in place today. Mr. Jesse. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do, uh, I do like a good story about a bridge that was a uh, very uh, comprehensive. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering it, if I'm if I understand correctly, uh, there there are mandated ongoing reviews of the infrastructure. Is there any trigger or um, arm that can be leveraged by people in in the public to say we think that this bridge is in dire need of an inspection and potentially a, a fix? Is there capacity for um, somebody, Joe Blow, to, to, to approach their MLA or the department and, and 
make an inquiry. Mr. Hackett. So the public's always open, uh, you know, to come to the department, talk to the local area managers, talk to the district directors about any highway concern they have. So whether it's the road or a bridge, and we do get a lot of those, obviously. We probably get thousands and thousands uh, every year. Um, and our staff will go out. They'll look at a structure if there's a, if there's a problem with it. They will do, the, do an inspection on it. They will do it. I mean, it, it may not be a large inspection unless it's required a large inspection. Uh, and they will go out and, uh, you know, provide the feedback to the, to the uh, person the, the member of the public or an MLA. We do get a lot of uh, questions on bridges um, when it comes down to safety of a bridge, condition of a bridge, when's the bridge going to be replaced because we see them on the program and they want their bridge replaced right away. What type of bridge are you going to put in if you have a replacement bridge? Um, you know, uh, we, we, are, we are also in a situation, the province I think in, um, in general has to consider, uh, it's not, uh, it, they have to consider the amount of infrastructure that we have. So, the, so as we mentioned earlier, there's 4,200 bridges in this province. We are adding more to the inventory all the time with twinned highways and new highways. Um, we are also adding uh, new roads to the province. We have 23,000 kilometers plus roads in the province that the, that the province looks after. And I think, Deputy Minister, it's 90% are ours. And the, uh, of, the, of all the roads in the province, 90% are ours. The rest are municipalities. We look after 23,000 kilometers of road. And that's a lot of infrastructure uh, when you're trying to get into a situation as, as, as the minister mentioned, uh, or the deputy minister mentioned in his opening remarks, all jurisdictions are going through the same thing. Aging infrastructure is a very important issue. Climate change is a very important issue. And, and the, the issue is right now we have a lot of infrastructure. So we also have to look at getting rid of infrastructure in the province as well, which is a tough thing to do. But if you continue to add, there has to be funding to go with it. And if there's not more funding, then we have to look at, at taking things out, which, which has been done in the past. Like many years ago, roads were taken out of service. They became a K-class road, and they were no longer maintained. And we have to look at that as a province as well, because it is a, um, uh, it is sort of, uh, uh, it's getting to that where we are getting older infrastructure. Mr. Jessel. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Hackett, you've kind of had uh, before my line of questioning uh, produced some um, testimony to the progression of, you know, it started out with an individual engineer or what have you in the department, and now we're moving towards uh, some type of a, a GIS system that kind of collaborates everything that uh, that we know and demonstrates where our assets are and what type of condition they're in. So there, it seems that there has been a, some progression towards a more productive and efficient system. Um, I'm wondering more specifically to, I guess, the, the point in time that the Auditor General's report was produced, um, what has been worked on at the department since that report was, was made available to yourselves? Mr. Hackett. Yeah, so a couple of things in the report that was brought that were brought up that were kind of quick for us. Um, there was a uh, an item about con uh, continuity in the system ex uh, as it exists today. So what's being in there right now is being it's the same information that's being placed in by each bridge engineer across the province. So that the continuity of that and to make sure that what's supposed to be in there is in there. So we've uh, we've we just hired a maintenance planner with us to start to help us with that part of it. Um, they'll be working with both our maintenance group and with our structures group uh, for a little while to try to get some of these uh, items up to date uh, that we promised in the in the report. Uh, also, uh, Mr. Millette's group uh, was there. They have an operations engineer, which is an audit engineer. That position's been, ba been vacant for about a year. Um, then they're going through the process of hiring for that person as well that will also help with some of this auditing process uh, in the short term. Um, Will's group uh, has just uh, currently gone through uh, an evaluation for a new bridge maintenance system, I would say, correct? 
yeah, they're in the process of reviewing and what the cost that would be. Uh, we've got some approvals for me to go to start investigating into this, what the cost uh, associated with that system would be. So we're in that that uh, part of it. Uh, Prince Edward Island, who does have a uh, new uh, bridge maintenance system, a relatively new bridge maintenance system, um, they're coming over sometime, I believe, next week to do a little presentation for us to how theirs work. Uh, so that uh, so in the very short term, we're starting to expand to see where we have to be in the next little while. We do understand that we uh, we have to get to the next step of a, uh, a bridge uh, maintenance system. Mr. Jessen. How am I doing for time, Mr. Chair? You have uh, two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Uh, the the paramount, paramount concern for everybody is, is safety, and I think you've demonstrated some reassurance for uh, for everybody here today. I'm just wondering, I know very, I just like to answer answer the question very clearly, you know, should should anybody be concerned that the bridges is, that they're traveling at any point are unsafe? Mr. I know, Hatch. I know there's, I, I know that they, nothing is 100%, but I think it's fair to say that there's been some demonstration here today that things are being carefully monitored. Um, there are professionals at the department who are keenly trained to to decide what's what's safe and, and, and when something needs to be um, put aside or fixed or closed down. I, I just, I, I, around the safety component, can you add some reassurance for us today? Mr. Hackett. So I can't say 100% on anything because I, I wouldn't know, you know, the in intricacies of every bridge. Um, and that would be, you know, looking at things like foundations and back walls and, and that sort of thing. Um, but based on what we inspect and what we know, um, the bridges are, are uh, in, in good shape. And, uh, and if they aren't in good shape, obviously, like I said, we start to take them out of service or reduce the service on them. We do, uh, you know, on occasion, there, there are surprises that happen to us that we don't, uh, we, didn't, we never identified um, and we saw. And, and uh, in, in a couple of cases in the last uh, uh, two years, we've had some bridges. The Myra Gut Bridge is an example that we did an inspection on the Myra Gut Bridge uh, because it, it didn't seem to be functioning properly and found out that the bridge uh, through the inspection was basically um, beyond its life. Like it could have probably been used a little bit, but I think at the end of the day, it was just uh, in the public safety to take the whole bridge out. Uh, another bridge very similar is in the Pan Bridge in Cumberland County. Uh, that bridge is on uh, trunk two, I think. Um, and it uh, another old uh, uh, arch truss structure that we're happy to get rid of because these old uh, steel truss bridges are probably going to be some of our bigger problems as we go forward and the less we have the better but that structure uh, you know went through a, a, an inspection found out one of the members underneath looked like it wasn't uh, functioning properly uh, we closed the bridge we did an inspection on the bridge we weighed the fact of, of uh, uh, of, a, of replacing it or re rehabilitating it we found that it was a better cost to, to just replace it so that wasn't, some of these things aren't always picked up in the, that exact, you know, inspection, but we inspect them enough that, that when we go through them, we find here's an issue, here's an issue. So for a good chunk of it, or a lot of it, or for the most part, we're, we're pretty confident. Um, but 100% I couldn't say, because I wouldn't know every structure. Like I said, 4,100 structures, a lot of issues with them, some are old, and um, uh, there's a lot of issues with them, just a lot of structures, but, uh, but fairly confident that, that we've got a fairly good system out there. Thank you, Mr. Hackett. We'll now move back to the PC caucus of Mr. Hallman for 13 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the Auditor General report indicates that there are 600 bridges that are classified uh, in poor condition. Should uh, the department release uh, the names of those 600 bridges? Mr. Hackett. So um, we, we, we could certainly release uh, the names of the bridges, um, but we wouldn't want to give out, uh, you know, all the, all the ratings on those. Every bridge, uh, every rating on a bridge doesn't mean that the bridge is in any kind of uh, sort of structural trouble. It, it just basically means there's an issue with the structure that needs uh, some attention to it. So by sending out that information and, and a bridge with a rating number next to it, uh, it 
it gets out the wrong information to the public. You need the details behind each bridge to understand what the issue is. And from that, you also have to understand what the department is preparing to do with it. So if it's got a rating of number three, and it's, like I mentioned before, it has a hole in the deck, but it's off to the side, it's, in the, it's not hurting the driving surface, but yet that's an issue, because the longer you leave a hole in the deck, the more, uh, you know, the more it'll get salt and snow and rain and everything in there, the more it'll rust out, become a problem in the future. It's not an immediate problem, but it could be a problem problem, but if you took that and you didn't understand that part of it and you just saw that it's a rating of three, it puts a, a public, uh, you know, a bit of a public um, a surprise into it. So you don't really want that. We want to make sure that the information that we have is, is good for us internally, but the information, if anything, we, we, we have to release that people understand what these things actually are um, so that they don't, uh, there's no panic involved. Um, and that's why the ratings are, the, the ratings are more meant for the internal staff to basically go out and figure out what work they have to do, as opposed to the public looking at the ratings and, and, and taking reactionary point to it. Mr. Holman. No, nope, Mr. LaFlush, sorry. Say, uh, in the material we sent Ms. Langell, there is a, uh, yeah, there is a National Bridge in Inventory General Condition Rating Guide. Uh, POR is actually uh, about halfway through the, the rating system, uh, but this would be a good thing to just to look for people to look at to understand the relevance of the different uh, terminologies and what they mean, and uh, maybe Mr. Uh, 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 Crocker could go through some of that and talk about what this means. Oh, you have it? Okay. okay. Just, Mr. Hackett. We, we we have released information on the bridges in the past through FOI pop, so just let that, that's usually the way that we've, we've uh, sent the information that the people have asked for. Just wanted to clarify. Mr. Holland. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Certainly, though, I think there could be a more transparent way to get that information out. Certainly, I mean, I'm of the opinion I think people can judge uh, the, the, the bridges themselves. I think they're capable of doing that, provided, of course, you provide the, the clear criteria. And, and, of course, that's my concern, and I think that's a concern of the Auditor General's report, is that internally, at times, there's such gaps that you don't have the necessary information or classifications or systems to determine uh, what bridges should be a priority and how those bridges should be ranked in terms of um, uh, addressing those, uh, those infrastru infrastructure gaps. Um, so let's take a look at some of these, uh, some of the internal gaps, specifically with uh, to the required annual reviews with contractors. Um, it states that the, in the AG report that the act of completing the required annual reviews would allow for the department to see whether contractors are meeting with the department's quality standards. Now, am I correct in saying that uh, none of the required annual reviews uh, were completed by the department? Am I correct in saying that? Mr. Crocker. Uh, that annual review with regards to contractors is separate from the overall bridge inspection. The contractor side of things is with respect to uh, bridge construction projects, and, and Mr. Millett can talk to that. Mr. Millett. Yep. Yes, we have a process in place where um, after the bridge is built to the standards outlined in the contracts, uh, we do an annual warranty inspection of the bridges that were done the year before, and any deficiencies noted at that time are brought up to the contractor uh, for repair. Mr. Holman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do we know the total number of projects that have not undergone the completion of a, of a required annual review? Do you have a number? Mr. Crocker? Mr. Hackett. So are you talking annual review for a, a contract being completed, do you mean, on a, on a bridge? Um, I don't have a number myself. I don't know if you guys have a number offhand. I can, we can find that out, though. Mr. Millett? No? no? I thought you were going to say so. No. no? Okay. Mr. Uh, Holman, sorry. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And could you outline how the department um, assesses a contractor's bid? What's the criteria that you use to evaluate a contractor's bid? Mr. Millett? We have a system where we, um, we do a compliant low bid process. So when the, the, the bids are received by the contractors, um, we analyze them for compliance uh, within, um, uh, within our own um, criteria around safety, around uh, insurance, uh, around compliance on um, 
on, on all that stuff. And if they do hit um, all those criteria, we award to the low bidder. Mr. Holm. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, looking at internally some other gaps that have been identified by the Auditor General, specifically with respect to warranties. Uh, I'm curious how the department will um, uh, improve monitoring contractor warranties uh, to make sure it recovers eligible uh, costs. Could you uh, talk us through that? What's, uh, what's the plan being put in place to address that gap? Mr. Crocker. So the department has recently implemented a bridge uh, commissioning process. So once a project, a uh, capital project has been completed on a bridge, uh, there's someone from uh, head office staff and engineer will go out and review the work that was done, make sure that everything was done. And that is part of the commissioning. And then there's as well as a warranty uh, process which has been developed and just recently implemented uh, to ensure uh, the responsibilities are laid out as to who's responsible for what and at what period of time to ensure that the bridge is reviewed prior to any warranty expiring to see if there's any deficiencies that might be, need to be addressed by the contractor. Mr. Hall. Has the province, has the province lost um, public money? As a, as a result of the failure to monitor uh, contractor warranties um, that would have otherwise come at the expense of the contractor. Mr. Hackett. Yeah, I, I, not that I'm, I guess, not that we're aware of in, in loss of, of funding. Um, some of the warranty issue here, uh, that it was an internal issue, and, and uh, as Will mentioned, we, we've got a policy in place that should be followed. Um, there was, the department went from uh, all projects having a one-year warranty, and, uh, and it kind of gets into a complicated area of, of accounting, but I won't get into that because I'm not an accountant, but, um, but it's, uh, we had a one-year warranty, then went to a three-year warranty. And so once we were in the one-year warranty, the, the project stayed sort of with the, with the project engineer for that period of time. So at the end of the one-year warranty, it was evaluated. And then uh, if the contractor had to come back and do warranty work, it was done. We went to that extended three-year warranty. The warranty work then turns from being a capital project, goes into a maintenance issue. And so two different funds of money and two different bodies of, of people. So you've got the project engineer, and then it goes into the, uh, into the maintenance group. And so there's where some of the, the, the problem occurred was that who is taking responsibility for the warranty. So as Will said, the, the policy is now in place. We kind of got it back up to where who's looking after what. But for the most part, um, the gap was only not that long, I don't think, when all that kind of occurred. So we don't think we've lost a lot of money, but certainly uh, I think it was, a, it was a process that we didn't really see as being an issue. We thought it just flipped from one to the other, but that wasn't quite happening at the field level. So now with our policy in place, we should be fine. That was a very short period of time. Yeah. Mr. Holm. Certainly, uh, and thank you for your response. I mean, it comes back to our initial conversation of who is taking responsibility, and I think it speaks to sort of the decision-making power structure where there's gaps. It, it, it's evident that there's silos that have developed over the years where, um, whether it's internally um, or externally, uh, at times people aren't sure who's responsible for what. And of course, we all know that that can, that can create uh, an element of difficulty and chaos. So I'm curious as to, um, you know, the decision makers. Um, who are the decision makers in the department that have to rely on this, at times, scattered information that the Auditor General has, has pointed out? Uh, who are those decision makers? Mr. Hackett. Uh, when you're talking about, I guess, scattered information, I mean, we, as, I guess as we explained earlier on the, on the bridge inspection information, the bridge engineers and the district staff have that information and from our from the way it's set up right now for each one of them, it's good information for them and it's good information that flows back to us. The information in the information system is not necessarily used, it's, 
it's not necessarily used for those decisions, I guess is what I'm getting at. The decisions are kind of, as we mentioned earlier, flows through the staff, and the staff sort of makes the decisions based on what should or shouldn't be uh, repaired or replaced. The, the system, that the, the software system doesn't provide those decisions. The software system just provides the data, uh, that, that the existing data of what we collected, it doesn't really give you any kind of decision trees. So there's really not a gap, I guess, is what I'm going to say, within our staff. We, the, the, there's no real gap with regard to what we do. It's all done basically by the individuals, by professional engineers, engineers of the department that take full responsibility or take responsibility for the highway system. And we take responsibility for the safety of the highway system. So that's all done internally, and we all understand that. Um, that's part of it. So I don't see the gap with that. The gap with the warranty issue that we're talking about, like I mentioned, it was, it's a gap that we didn't recognize because of more of an accounting issue than it was a, uh, an engineering issue. So we would take responsibility of that amongst ourselves, but it, it, was, it, it may have been on the warranty. Uh, we don't think we lost anything on that, but uh, even if that bridge went into service, which it did after construction, it would have been inspected the year after and the year after and the year after that. The only thing we would have missed on it, whether it was still under warranty or not, that's, I'm just saying for that gap, which is a short gap, but uh, that's all I can really say about the gaps that have been identified. Mr. Holland, one minute. And what uh, action plan or steps are being taken now to deal with that gap with respect to warranties that you've alluded to with respect to accounting and engineering? Mr. Hackett. So we've identified the, the individual in each district that takes responsibility for that warranty based on our policy. So when the, warrant, when the, when the, when the bridge goes into service at substantial completion, the information is passed along to the construction manager, I believe, who it goes to now, and they will take responsibility for the next three years to ensure that the warranty is completed. And then the issue, like I said before, once you get into that three-year period, there's an accounting issue because you go from capital funding to, to operational funding. Who's going to cover the operational funding? And we've identified that would be done at the at the field level, we'll, we, we've where the, where the money's going to come from. So we, we have to figure it out, yes. Thank you, Mr. Hackett. Thank you, Mr. Holman. Now move to the NDB caucus and Ms. Roberts. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Um, I, I want to quickly go back to the Auditor General's recommendations and specifically uh, your responses to the recommendations. And I was, I was struck that in, in quite a few instances, the department committed to uh, completing certain recommendations within six months, which is a, a short time frame. Uh, I recognize that we're only a month and a half in since the audit was officially um, published, so you would have been aware of many of these of these issues um, uh, from earlier. So I'm wondering uh, if we can go through those. And one of the one of the uh, recommendations that you accepted uh, was uh, related to um, hiring a maintenance planner. Or that was part of your response was hiring a maintenance planner. So is that in on track to be complete within the six months, Mr. Hackett? Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, uh, first of all, not to get the name of my MLA wrong, um, but the, the score sheet here is not quite correct, so that's why I'm confused all the time of the seating arrangement. Um, so uh, we do have a table here of how far we've already advanced on those recommendations. I'm going to scour this, and I'll give you the table if I can find it. It's in this mess here on my desk. Um, but maybe uh, Peter can talk about uh, hiring in government. Always a challenge. Mr. Hackett. Well, in the, on the first part of the maintenance planner, we were able to get somebody internally into, into that position fairly quickly. So that person is currently in the position. Uh, we've got to, you know, we've, we have, they're in within six months, but we've got to get them up to speed on what we want them to do here as well. So uh, it will take a little bit of time to get them to uh, start looking at this information, but we do have that person in place. Ms. Roberts. Thank you for that answer. Um, also, in response to an auditor general, one of the one of the recommendations, there's a com the department made a commitment to hire a quality assurance position, and I wonder if you're on, on track to complete that within six months. But also, if if you could comment on why that position had been vacant and, and how long it had been vacant, Mr. Malay. We are in the process of hiring that position. Um, that position has been vacant for a couple of years. Um, we, we had some personnel issues uh, around uh, that specific uh, position and the person that would have been the manager that was hi hierarchy over that position. So we had to, um, actually we're in the process of hiring a new manager and that took some time as well. So everything 
uh, took time, but the main reason why uh, we didn't fill the position was that the manager's position and that position were vacant at the same time, so we we did the manager's position first. And um, that position we had to replace within six months because they had left as well. So it was a long process, but we're in the process of hiring that position now. Ms. Roberts. And, and can you remind me or, or just speak quickly to the the role of that position in responding to the Auditor General's recommendations related to these bridges? Mr. Wright. That specific role audits the contracts to make sure that the bridges or the roads are built to the standards that we specify in the contract. So um, they'd go and audit the, the project um, in detail uh, in the project engineer's office and they'd write a report as to where we differed away from what we said we were gonna build. Ms. Roberts. So just, just help me out here, given that, you know, obviously the work of both signing contracts and the work on uh, our highway infrastructure and other infrastructure has been continuing. Has, has that work simply not been happening for the past several years then? Mr. Malay. For two years, yes. Ms. Roberts. And how should I understand that as an MLA? Is that something that, that should be concerning? Obviously, it was concerning to the Auditor General, but I wonder if you can just give me some more context for that. Mr. Hackett. So yeah, the position's an internal audit position. It hasn't been two years. It's probably more like uh, uh, probably maybe 12, no, probably 16 months is what it's been vacant for. I think it was in the late fall of 2017. Uh, yeah, the, the, the position, um, there is other people in that position, like not in that direct position, but works in that, worked in that group. So the information's being collected. Um, the auditing reports that we should be doing internally weren't being completed over that last 16 months. You are correct. So that's where we try, we got to get ourselves back into that, uh, that position. Um, we did have, as, as uh, Don mentioned, that uh, we have had a number of staff turnover and that sort of uh, kept that, that position vacant for that little period of time. But uh, it is an issue with trying to get uh, uh, things moving along, you know, within government to hire. Ms. Roberts. Mm -hmm. We've already uh, discussed quite a lot around the bridge warranty, so I'm going to skip over that one, which um, the department also committed to uh, to having a monitoring process related to warranties within six months. But quickly, uh, formal documentation of bridge inspector training is another uh, thing that the com department committed to do within six months. Are you on track? Mr. Crocker. So... It's not a concern that the inspections aren't, or sorry, the inspectors aren't getting trained. It's just that we don't have the documentation. So the preparation of that document outlining the specific training uh, requirements for an inspector is ongoing. Yes. Mr. Roberts. Moment. And so you expect that you will, in fact, uh, accomplish that within six months? Mr. Crocker. Yes. Okay. Mr. Roberts. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back. Um, a little bit to uh, climate change and following up on this uh, report uh, related to um, the expected costs um, on of Im on infrastructure um, of catastrophic climate impacts. Uh, we asked the emergency management office if it had made an estimate of the investments we need to make over the next decade to make our critical infrastructure like bridges more resilient to the climate crisis. Um, and the emergency management office told us we should ask each department directly. So um, Mr. LaFleche, do you have an estimate of the investments necessary to make the critical infrastructure your department is responsible for? or ready for the increasing impacts of climate of the climate crisis mr. LaFleche. Uh, yeah we are we are working on that as you know we've um, uh, got uh, several uh, sensitive areas in Nova Scotia where uh, let, let's just get beyond climate change just uh, post glacial uh, uh, ice age rebound is, is causing effects in some of the, the lateral uh, areas of the province so um, we're, uh, we're doing studies wherever we can. You might know that uh, I think MP Casey has been very vocal about the study in his area. Uh, we are doing a joint study with New Brunswick and the federal government on the whole Shignecto Ismith. 
uh, to determine uh, what, what's, uh, what's happening there and how we should best adapt uh, to whatever is causing the higher sea level rise there in that area. Um, in terms of other areas of the province, we have some sensitivity in southwest Nova that we are, we are looking at and uh, we, uh, we're trying to get a handle on. The Bay of Fundy, uh, recently there was a couple of announcements and uh, uh, particularly of a major uh, uh, climate change mitigation uh, capital funding uh, between us and the federal government to raise uh, a, a series of dike structures and repair abatos in the Bay of Fundy. Um, so we're, we're doing it as we go. We're using, we're using uh, opportunities that become available for funding to either study or immediately remediate uh, and uh, structures to adapt to climate change. But do we have all the answers for every single case? No, never will. Uh, it's always a work in progress. So we're doing the best we can, and I think we're making significant process, uh, progress uh, on this file. Very pleased on the Bay of Fundy side. I think we're well covered there. I think we're well covered on the Chignecto Isthmus uh, and the extreme southwest of Nova Scotia where there is some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, lowering of the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the crustal area around the coast, um, uh, that's something that we've got to take a look at for the roads there. And uh, we'll, we, are, uh, we are on that, and we've uh, worked a bit with the local uh, municipal councillors in that area. So we're doing the best we can uh, to get that done as opportunities arise and uh, hopefully uh, long before uh, there's any um, urgency, we will have climate proofed to the extent one can ever can our, our road infrastructure. Ms. Roberts. Um, you know, a, a lot of what, of what I think your answer just addressed is, is adaptation, and certainly we are at the point that we cannot avert um, the change uh, and the quite dramatic change that is happening uh, to sea level rise and and in our climate, um, but there there is also still mitigation, and I'm wondering if uh, if at the level of leadership in your department there's consideration of mitigation, including um, greenhouse gas reductions at all, as infrastructure is being planned. And and I'm sometimes struck uh, somehow I didn't realize that there was an. It, um, I was struck at seeing a, a new overpass on the the 103 yesterday, just past the old water treatment um, plant, and I'm like, is what is that an interchange? Because there's another uh, community there that will be very difficult to service through um, public transit, for example. Um, so yeah, what what is your department doing to look at how your planning and infrastructure investments are in line with climate change uh, mitigation. Mr. Yeah. Well, Before he starts, uh, um, uh, you mentioned quite a few things there. So maybe I misinterpreted your original question. Um, in terms of, of, of mitigating the effects of climate change, of course, uh, my colleague C Simon D'Entremont at the Department of Energy is the lead on that. Uh, but we work closely with them on public buildings and uh, public highway infrastructure to ensure that we, uh, we do all we can to reduce greenhouse gas effects when we build that infrastructure. Uh, I don't want to go, uh, it would take a lengthy time to go into the building issues right now and what we've done in that area uh, and uh, what, uh, what we're doing on the highway side, maybe Peter can address a bit. Uh, I just want to point out the, uh, the uh, overpass you're referring to is not an interchange, it's an overpass, and it's a highly popular and sought after overpass uh, for, for uh, access for uh, uh, alternative transportation. And we're building more and more of those. As we twin sections of highway where there's no ability now to get across a highway where there might have been before it was twinned, we have to provide access for uh, active transportation. Uh, and also there may be some residual uh, landowners who have uh, historic rights that we have to uh, deal with. And so that's why you see those types of structures. They're, they're not, uh, I know there's a popular uh, radio show guy who criticized that very structure and the 
doubling of the size of the Ingram Port Interchange uh, because he didn't understand about twinning. Um, but uh, we don't do those things for nothing. We actually think through them and they're, they're well thought out. We work with the AT communities across the province. Uh, one of the recent examples of what we put in was the bridge uh, just at the Ingram Port Connector Road. Um, and that delayed the opening of the road and we got heavily criticized for that. But that active transportation structure, which uh, is highly popular with all of the AT groups, the biking groups, and uh, we felt that there was a major safety concern by trying to get them across the connector road without putting in that bridge. We did another one on Cow Bay Road uh, when we twinned the 105, Very a lot of controversy around that. I think the chair would know about something about that. Went back and forth for a long time. At the end, we decided that the safest way to get uh, bicycles through there and, and walkers uh, was to create that structure uh, over the 125. But again, sometimes these are controversial and we do get beat up for them. Uh, but we have to make decisions and our masters, political masters, make political decisions to do what they think is the right thing for the public. Not everybody agrees that those structures are good, but um, uh, they do provide access and they're part of uh, what we would consider uh, a, a tourism blue route network around the province for, for bike slipping. So on that, I'll pass No, that that's to good. Thank you. That ends the time for the NDP caucus. We'll now move to the Liberals and Mr. Horn. Thank you for being here today. I'm very pleased uh, that you are. Our, our highways are an important part of our uh, existence and use, so uh, this is very important that we understand. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, one is the needs assessments that are being done uh, for uh, highways and roadways and bridges. Um, I'm wondering, uh, one hasn't been done, it's done I guess every 10 years, uh, and I'm wondering how that stands now, uh, when you expect it to be uh, done. Mr. Hackett. Yeah, so we're currently um, looking at, uh, at the needs assessment study for our capital, so our, our capital paving program, our bridge program, and our uh, fleet, which is part of our capital program as well. We buy our, buy our uh, vehicles. So we're just in the last uh, parts of that, uh, that study, um, and that report should be, I guess, completed uh, very shortly, and then we'll present it to the, to the minister, and then we'll decide what our next, next steps are after that. But yeah, it's, it was probably back in 2008 or 2009, the last one was, was completed, so uh, uh, we're, we're getting pretty close to being done. Mr. Horn. Uh, also on the question of the selection and quality management of bridge projects, uh, in the chapter two of the uh, Auditor General's report, uh, on page 29, one of the bullets that's uh, it's finding a little confusing is uh, no annual quality assurance audits have been completed since October 2017. Is, uh, what does that mean uh, for our roads and our bridges? Mr. Hackett. So as, as uh, Don Millet mentioned earlier, we have an internal, so internally the department, uh, because we um, do a lot of our own tendering um, uh, went in conjunction with the procurement office, but we do a lot of, uh, most of our tendering for the highway side is done uh, internally. Um, and, and we have a, uh, we have a team of tendering uh, staff that put together the, the tender documents and we have a, uh, uh, an IT system, which is a, a bid X system. So all the bidders can bid uh, electronically electronically. Uh, so be because of that and because of the fact that we do a lot of our own work internally, uh, we have an internal audit system and which basically does reports on how our capital projects projects are being done. So they, they recognize our, um, are the policies being, being followed, are the specifications being followed, not on every job, they just do sort of uh, random audits. So we, do have, we do have that team together, there's a manager there, there's, uh, there was a, 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 an executive or a, a, an engineering aide with that group, uh, but the engineering, uh, the, the audit position, which was a, an operations engineer, we call it, has been vacant since the end of 2017. We mentioned that earlier, so we're in the process now of, of putting that position back in place. Mr. Horn. That's, that's it. Ms. Costanza. Thank you, Mr. Um, Mr. Chair. Um, my, uh, actually, I'm relating to the, something that my colleague has mentioned about giving the rating out to the public. And to me, as a, as a 
user of uh, certain bike routes and, and this, I, I, it actually would worry me to know if I don't understand. I was just at the Muscadab, cycling the Sunday on Muscadab, and I looked at the bridge that I crossed, and I thought, wow, this is a really very, um, you know, a big structure, and, and I know you're uh, categorizing them by length, and I believe that bridge is quite long, but the usage of that bridge is very light. So are we not considering what the volume of cars and, and, and um, maintenance required compared to, so are these 600 poor bridges, is that could have been one of them that gets used so little, but is considered a poor quality, if it was, I don't even know, but to me it looked absolutely fantastic and, and large, but how do we rate those 600 poor and the usage and the number of cars that are using those bridges? Mr. Crocker. So, in terms of the actual rating a bridge would receive, on, according to the MBI rating system, the, the use, the, all those sorts of things are not taken into consideration for the rating of the bridge. Items such as what you are just talking about with regards to the location, type of highway, traffic volumes, uh, impact to the community, those are the sites of, sorts of uh, information that we take in deciding what actions we might take on a particular bridge in conjunction with the bridge inspection rating. Ms. Dika stands. So that goes to my point is if we publicize all these ratings, people are going to panic with no reason, right? There is many issues that related to, and it's best left to the engineers who are professional, who know what, you know, the poor standard is and, and not the public to get worried about the smaller uh, bridges. The, the other thing that I, a comment that I really wanted to make and, and very, and I don't know how much of the department was involved in, is that the uplift of the McDonald Bridge. To me, that was an amazing thing that happened in Halifax. And, uh, you know, to, to see it actually driving underneath and where there's a piece missing, this was an incredible thing that's only done in Canada twice, one in BC and one here. So I just wanted to know what was the, your involvement, if there was any, uh, I know it's with the, the commission and the maintenance and how, um, how do you rate that uh, as, as an accomplishment for, for uh, your department? Mr. LaFleche. Well, uh, you're, you're quite right on the McDonald Bridge. This was uh, uh, only the second time that they tried to do a redecking while the bridge was open. It was a deliberate decision uh, for the Bridge Commission uh, management to do that. Uh, there were a lot of complaints about it, but the other option was to close the bridge for a couple of years. So, uh, you know, it's six of one, half dozen of the other. At the end of the day, we, we believe they made the right decision, which was to keep the bridge open and uh, do the redecking in this very innovative way. Um, they worked very hard on it. Uh, we would pr provided them some assistance and advice, but it was really their job. And uh, we, we've got to say that we're very proud. That that's our Crown Corporation, reports to the Minister. We're very proud of the work they've done. And uh, uh, we think that saved the public considerable grief, despite the fact that the public thought there was grief. They don't know what grief they were going to get. They went on and on about the infamous bump, you know, and they could have had no bridge with no bump for two years. And that might have been a bit worse. So they, yes, endured the bump for two years, but they had a bridge with a bump open. So, it, you know, again, it's, it's, a, it's how you look at it, right, that matters. Do you want to say anything about the engineering of the bridge, Will? Will? No. Ms. T. Costanza. <laughs> to me, it was an incredible thing that was happening here, and we lifted it for a reason, uh, and, and I think we are very grateful. I'm just hoping that it's going to last a, a very long time as a result of it, instead of, I'm sure the cost of putting a whole new bridge would have been a lot more. And, uh, and a lot longer as well. So I just wanted to say a comment to, to that. Thank you. Mr. LaFleche. Oh, sorry. Just your microphone's not on, that's all. Oh, we will be raising, the, or I'm not sure if they've done it yet, but they will be raising the bridge if they have not by a little over, I think about a metre, a metre and a half, which although it sounds insignificant, is significant for the series terminal. So it was one of the objectives. So not only was it a great job in terms of its efficiency and cost, it was also allowed us increased activity at the series terminal, which as you know, everything we get to the series terminal decreases truck traffic 
on the street right here. Mr. McGuire with uh, three and a half minutes. Three and a half minutes. Uh, okay, so just quickly, uh, I have two things, so just quickly. Um, I know uh, Mr. Flesh, you had talked earlier, and just something I was always curious about, uh, about the freeze-thaw cycle and, and how, you know, uh, it's been um, something, you know, we face hundreds of times during the winter. And, and so it obviously puts a bit of a beating into our roads uh, between, the, between the water mains and things being dug up for lines and stuff like that. Have you guys ever looked, is, and this is, the pr answer is probably no, but is there any other material that can be used that's more malleable for our winter conditions? We do a lot of flesh. And uh, I'll let uh, Peter speak to that or Don, but we do do a lot of experience. We have changed our mix around the province. It's, it's not the same in Yarmouth. If you look at some of the roads there, they plasticize, they, they don't pothole, they bend, because uh, they have a different... Yeah, it's too hot, <laughs> right. Uh, whereas they pothole in other areas, in other areas you've got a lot of um, glacial, uh, uh, superficial till that forces through boulders like you do in central Canada. So everything's different. But we do experiment, we try different things. Some things work, some don't. We, we had an opportunity earlier, but we ran out of time to get into the whole chip seal versus asphalt thing. Uh, do you want to say anything, Don, about I, I road surface or Peter? Mr. Hackett. Very, so very quickly, uh, we've, uh, we've, uh, we're going to employ uh, UNB to come look at our asphalt, uh, do a forensic study on our asphalt for the last five to ten years uh, to see what's working best for us and uh, to see what isn't working. So just a FYI. Mr. McGuire. That I was curious about because I know, uh, you know, it's it's in Nova Scotia, it's completely different than Alberta, like you were saying. Like, you know, I know we get people will complain about the roads, but you know, it's when it's thawing and freezing so often, and uh, it's very difficult. Uh, I want to close with you have an employee that's leaving this year who's had almost 40 years of experience. So I want to thank everybody in HRM in particular has had to deal with uh, several times, dozens of times, hundreds of times, uh, Mr. Hugh Burns. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's a lot of experience going out the door. Uh, Mr. Burns has been exceptional in that role in that position, and I want to, on record, uh, congratulate him on a long career and I hope he gets that time to finally fish so uh, you know I don't know how you're going to replace him but it's not going to be easy well, I may not be Mr. I may not be signing the paperwork so hold tight <laughs> <laughs> we have a, a large number Huey Burns is a great case of people who have served the public well for a long time through many many governments he's the operational supervisor here in the, in the, in the Halifax central area um, but we have employees, uh, we have at least one who've done 50 years and, uh, you know, these are people who have really contributed to the province. After 35 years, they're not adding anything else up. Mr. McGuire. Really appreciate a service and uh, I spent uh, every, at the end of every summer, I, for the last six years, I've convinced, tried to convince him to stay on and this year, uh, unfortunately, no, but uh, yeah, just you know, I think everybody around here, we deal with these, with the bureaucrats, whether they're here for 35, 40 years or two or three years, and they all do an exceptional job. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that ends the question period. If you want to make some closing statements before we move on to committee business. Yes, Mr. LaFlesh. It will be on me. I'll put my foot down. Thank you for allowing me to do that. Um, so uh, one, I do want to, I didn't finish answering you McKay's question. I'll just do that quickly. Uh, yeah, the software uh, that we have for the provincial information system uh, it was not initially developed, but is being completed by the College of Geographic Sciences. And we're working closely with them. Uh, and we are using that provincial asset uh, as we do this work. Um, I want to touch on uh, MLA McGuire's comment about the operational supervisors. Uh, if anybody has any worry about any bridge, any road, any structure, please do call the maintenance or operational supervisor in your area. All MLAs should have access to their cell phone numbers. We can get you that if you don't. They are your point of contact. I realize that the general public has to go through a call centre, which is also very efficient, but we try and provide MLAs with the, the best service. If you don't know who your operational or maintenance supervisors are, uh, let us know and we'll get you, you their names and uh, they can go over any structure. 
Uh, we are on, Peter and uh, Don and I and others, Mark Peach are on road tours this summer, and uh, anybody who needs us to go to their uh, particular riding, let me know. Of course, uh, I'm, I'm sort of crutching it out there in the, on, the, on the tour, but uh, we, will, uh, we will definitely go to uh, any, number, uh, any number of uh, sites that we have to, to look at things and to work with the members of uh, local public concerned citizens uh, to ensure that uh, they are being listened to. Can't always do everything for everybody, but we can at least listen to them. So we'll be out there in the road. Want to thank you. Want to thank uh, my staff here. And of course, I want to thank uh, the Auditor General and his staff for uh, the great uh, working relationship we have uh, had on this uh, file concerning the auditing of our uh, bridge maintenance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes the witnesses' questioning, so we're going to move on to committee business. Um, first of all, correspondence. Uh, in your packet, we have, you have a uh, Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing uh, information requested from the May 22nd, 2019 meeting. Um, is there any further discussion or information that needs to be brought up on that letter? Hearing none, we'll accept the letter as tabled. Uh, Auditor General briefings. The subcommittee has discussed and agreed that it would like to continue with have the AG provide briefings in advance of the meetings. This item was brought up, uh, this item was on the record of a decision that was put forward to the full committee on June 12th meeting, but was not specifically dealt with. Uh, does the committee agree that the AG briefing should continue? Hearing no uh, opposition, we'll agree that that does continue. Uh, witnesses to come. On the May 29th report of the Auditor General, Chapter 1, Diversity and Inclusion in the Public Sector. This chapter involves four departments, the Public Service Commission, Agriculture, Community Services, and Justice. All of the deputies can be available on the October 11th, except for the Deputy of Community Services. They have indicated that the Associate Deputy Minister is available and could attend if the committee is agreeable. Uh, if the committee is not agreeable, we'll have to look at booking these people back into the new year. Has everybody agreed to have the Associate Deputy Minister of Community Services attend instead of the Deputy Minister? Hearing no opposition, we'll go ahead with that, uh, Ms. Langell. Uh, the use of P3 for twinning of the highways between Anagonish and Picto. Transportation Infrastructure Renewal has been contacted to appear on September 11th. The Deputy is not available, but the Chief Engineer, Mr. Hackett, could attend. Does the committee agree with having Mr. Hackett attend? Mr. Jessup. Mr. Chair, um, over the past several months, we've uh, been committed to um, focusing our meetings in this, uh, in this committee on the reports and responses to the reports of the Auditor General's office. Uh, last meeting, we diverted uh, unintentionally from that uh, commitment, and uh, therefore I would like to make a motion in keeping with that commitment to stay focused on the AG, the work of the AG's office. Um, therefore, I would like to move that the topic for September 11th on the use of P3s for twinning the highway between Antigonish and Picto be recommended to the Natural Resources and Eco Economic Development Committee for consideration as a future topic. Could I just ask for some uh, clarity from the legal? This was a topic that was brought up at the subcommittee meeting and agreed upon, and brought up at the last full committee meeting and agreed upon. Is that something that uh, that can be just changed now all of a sudden, uh, Mr. Hepp? I think the committee would first have to rescind the motion to, since this committee has decided to, to hear it itself, I think that motion would have to be rescinded. Otherwise, you'd be asking the topic to be dealt with by two committees. So I think you would have to rescind the motion first, the, the previous motion, before Mr. Jessen's motion would be in order. Mr. Holland. So we agreed at subcommittee that this topic should go forward. A motion was brought forward at the full committee, approved. Um, the topic is of importance to Nova Scotians. I've always said that where appropriate, when a topic is in the provincial interest, and I believe this to be in the provincial interest, that the topic should go forward. It's gone through all the formal channels, and now you want to you want to change that. And that no, like that's unacceptable. The topic's gone through all the formal mechanisms for approval, and uh, it, it should we should proceed 
with this topic on September 11th with uh, Mr. Hackett as the, as the witness. Ms. Roberts. And, and I would just add that this, this topic falls squarely in the mandate of this committee, which is, um, which is looking at the effective administration and, and expenditure of public funds. Um, that's why it's the Public Accounts Committee. So, um, and there's nothing in our, the mandate of our committee that says that we may only look at Auditor General reports. Um, we are keeping up. Um, at this juncture with, um, with the reports of the Auditor General. We're, we're not at this juncture far behind. And, uh, and I too feel like having um, gone through the subcommittee process, having gone through the full committee and, and got, gotten the support of the full committee to call this, call this topic, um, we absolutely should push ahead for September. Ms. Roberts, or Ms. LeBlanc, sorry. Uh, yes, I agree with my colleagues. I, uh, I think, and as my colleague uh, from Halifax Needham has just said, um, you know, it is about the expenditure of public funds. And in this case, the evidence that's been released in the report, uh, in a recent report, uh, suggests that there is a huge discrepancy in the amount of money that the province could be spending. Uh, I think that we cannot afford, as a province and as a committee, to ignore this topic at this committee. When we debated about you know what what was going to be brought forward and what wasn't at this committee, you know almost it feels like a year ago. I'm not sure when it began. Maybe six months ago. Uh, uh, this was exactly the reason why uh, myself and my colleague. Uh, we're opposed to the changes that were being brought forward uh, because these kinds of things need to be in this chamber in front of uh, as, as public as possible, not hidden away in a small committee room where the very little uh, public has access to the discussion. I strongly oppose the motion and I think that we should stay as uh, Mr. Holman suggested that we should stay with uh, the meeting on September 11th with this topic with Mr. Hackett as the witness. Mr. Holman. My colleague from Dartmouth North makes some very important points. Let's not forget the big picture. Let's not forget what's transpired here in the last number of months. Um, the Liberal Caucus has limited the scope of investigation, thereby limiting uh, this committee's ability to uh, question public expenditures and to question the execution of public administration. And then they limit the time in which we can meet and now today, they, because, because this topic isn't within perhaps you know, their advantage, uh, they want to now change uh, a decision that went through all the formal mechanisms, all the formal channels, subcommittee, committee. And now because uh, for whatever reason, you feel that this isn't working to your advantage, but it's clearly in the public's interest to have this topic at public accounts, you now want to, to, to modify that and change the rules. And that, that's unacceptable uh, to, to those in the opposition. And I hope, I think, it, I know it's unacceptable to Nova Scotians. So where do they go next? Where do they go next with this? Mr. Jessam. I'd just like to state for the record that with the exception to being televised, every other committee is just as accessible to all Nova Scotians as any other committee. The media is as much present in the other committee room as they would be here. Um, the public has every opportunity to attend these meetings. Um, in our other meetings, every member has the same capacity to ask questions. Uh, there is, has resoundingly been um, fair um, time to ask questions at meetings uh, outside of the Public Accounts Committee. Um, we are just as accountable through other committees as we are here at Public Accounts. The only one piece that is different is that it is televised via Ledge TV. There are transcripts from all the testimony that goes on at committees. So this concept that there is something sinister about our intention to try and um, reorchestrate 
committees in a way that we believe is more efficient, uh, that enables specifically the Public Accounts Committee to focus specifically, as we've been discussing for several months, on the work of the Auditor General and the responses uh, that departments are required to have. Um, that there, there's, there, there's nothing, again, sinister about what's taking place here, and there is just as much capacity for opposition members to ask questions at other committees and the media to attend, the public to attend. So in saying all that, uh, I would like to amend my initial motion. Order, please. That uh, limits the time for the committee today. Next meeting will take place on August the 14th here in the chamber. Time's expired. You did not ask for extension.